What's up, guys? This is Justin Khan, and you are listening to The Quest, my new podcast about sharing the interesting journeys of people in my life. I am super excited to introduce you guys to my close friend, Jason Tan. Jason and I have known each other for years, and he is the founder and CEO of SIFT, a digital trust and safety company based in San Francisco. Uh, Jason and his girlfriend were actually at our house in Northern California when quarantine hit, and we've ended up spending a lot of time together in the last couple months, which is great because my wife and I can't really imagine two other people that we would rather spend time with. And the reason I'm really excited to bring Jason on is that he is one of the most curious people that I know. He's always trying new things, and a lot of the wisdom that I've learned about consciousness in the past couple years has come from things that Jason has told me about. One of the things I really admire about him is that he is able to keep a beginner's mind and open curiosity, uh, especially about other people, and that's something that I really try to emulate in my own life. So in our conversation, we talked about Jason's story to founding the company, uh, battling depression, his personal transformation, uh, T groups and learning to talk about emotions, our learnings from ayahuasca, and more. It was a really fun one for me to do, and I hope you enjoy it. So here is Jason Tan. Hey, Jason. Hey, Justin. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So... I want to talk about the journey that uh, I guess we've both been on in the last couple of years. But before that, I'd love to introduce you to everybody out there and uh, tell them a little bit about your background, uh, what you've been up to. What's the Jason Tan origin story? Yeah. So I, I was born in Taiwan in 1986 in Taipei and then uh, lived there for a few years, moved to Tokyo for a few years. And then Singapore for another five. And at 12 years old in 1997, I immigrated with my family to Seattle, Washington, and then went to the University of Washington, graduated in 2006, uh, worked at a bunch of startups in Seattle, and then moved down to San Francisco in 2011 to go through Y Combinator, which is where I met you, and then I started SIFT, the company that I currently run. I want to talk a little bit about your early formative years, kind of starting startups that are Actually, before you got into startups, when you were just, you started working in tech, because I think you had some experiences that you shared with me about how you had, um, you know, I think you approached life with a certain attitude. Yeah. I think for me, I think credentialism has been something I struggle with, where I put a lot of value on the pedigree of institutions and especially companies I would work for. And so going through college at the University of Washington, I really had my eyes set on working at a Google or Amazon or, or Facebook. This was back in 2006. So honestly, Facebook wasn't even that big then. So it was mostly like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. And I was a really good student, you know, magna cum laude, and had research projects and all that stuff. But I think for some reason, the interview processes for these big companies really spooked me. And, you know, you might be familiar with this, but when you apply for a software engineering job, the interview I learned actually is unlike a lot of other interviews, whereas because in the, with a software engineering interview, you actually have to solve problems, hypothetical live. engineering problems live on a whiteboard with someone watching you over your back. And it's I've completely learned no, like nothing about doing actual programming. Exactly. Well, there is programming, but it's not the way you would actually write code. And on top of that, having now built a company and done you know probably thousands of interviews at this point, um, every other function like you're just asking about their past and their behaviors and you're not asking them to solve. Like you, if I was interviewing for interviewing for a general counsel, I'm not like asking them to write, you know, legal contracts on the whiteboard. Anyways, I bombed all the interviews for these dream jobs I wanted. And it was pretty soul crushing. I, I couldn't even talk to my parents about it because I just felt so ashamed of myself. But I think that was, you know, a really important moment for me because uh, luckily, a friend of mine had interned at a company called Zillow the previous summer, and he uh, put in my name with the uh, the VP of engineering. And that guy reached out to me, and he was like, "Hey, you know, we're hiring here at Zillow." And I was like, "Who's Zillow? What what is, what is this? What is this?" And you know, startups were not nearly as big as they are now, especially in Seattle. This was back in 2006, right? So for me, I had no other choice. So I went and interviewed with this company that I'd never heard about, and for some reason, like that lack of pressure and that lack of like not wanting it so badly 
uh, helped me do really well in the interviews, and I got a job offer. And you were young then, right? You were yeah, you had gone I, to college early. Yeah, so I did this program called the Academy for Young Scholars. It's a little pretentious sounding, but people aren't so pretentious, I, I hope. Um, and so, yeah, I started college at 16 and graduated at 20. Um, so I didn't finish high school. I, I don't have a high school diploma. And so when you were when you were graduate, you had been on this track, I guess, your life in your life, like of of kind of achieving and being successful and going to college early, and then you were going to go get a job at Google. And when you couldn't get a, you know, a, a, couldn't land a job at one of these like prestigious tech companies that would have been like, in some ways a continuation, you end up going to Zillow, which is a startup, and nobody knew about startups, and you didn't know about Zillow. Zillow was like a fifty person company at the time. Yeah. Something like that. So it wasn't like an institution, public company like it is today. And what was that like? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think that was the first um, experience that really taught me this idea of when one door closes, another one opens. And at Zillow, I had the time of my life, you know, working for Rich Barton, the co-founder and CEO. And, uh, you know, he was just a master of creating culture. And I observed and just learned so much from the people around me. And it was just a high quality group of people. And um, that really got me excited about the world of startups that got me interested in this ability to create something from the ground up and to have a high impact and to be able to learn a lot very quickly. And so I, I'm very thankful, actually, for Google and Microsoft and you know Amazon for rejecting me because I don't think I would have had that experience, that really rich and, and valuable experience. And then that led me down a path of working at more and more startups and then eventually starting my own company in 2011. So Rich, Rich is kind of like the godfather of Seattle startups, right? He's yeah. Expedia, Zillow, uh, many others, Avo, a uh, bunch of other companies that Real that Self that he's, cre- he's created, yeah. And so what was it like to, did you get a, I guess it was like a master class to see how startups get created to, to work closely with them? Yeah, but, but a funny digression here. Uh, Rich actually took me to Vegas for my 21st birthday. <laughs> 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 yeah, so like at the holiday party, before I turned 21, a bunch of other colleagues at Zillow, you know, everyone was kind of drunk and, and Rich was kind of drunk too. And, and my colleagues had... We're, we're clamoring to Rich to organize and sponsor a Vegas trip for me because I was like, you know, turning 21, which you is were like the kid of the company. I was the kid of the company. Yeah. I, uh, Rich, if you're listening, I, I appreciate that. That was a baller move and a, a fun trip. Um, but yeah, just I think Rich had a really good sense of hiring adults early on. And I think uh, in my own experience of, of building a company, just having that careful and healthy balance between young and old and experience versus, you know, uh, just out of, out of college. Like I, I found that, um, to produce the, the best environments where there's a really holistic culture. Um, you don't want things to be one too one sided in my experience. And, and so really appreciative to, to having a great teacher like that in, in the early years. At a certain point though, things went kind of South at the company, right? You were working at Zillow. You were kind of the star, right? One of the best engineers, but then what happened? Yeah. So, I mean, I was getting promoted every year, I was getting extra stock option grants every six months. It was just like, you know, I was on this fast track. And I think if I was to be honest with myself, looking back at that age, a lot of things got to my head, right? When you graduate college at 20, um, you kind of think, or I thought I was hot shit. I thought I was, you know, God's gift to the world because I graduated college at 20 and I was working at the startup. I was getting promoted and all that. And I, I just had a huge ego. And um, the 2008 economic crisis came along and everyone had to really cut back very, you know, similar to what's happening right now with COVID. And, um, I remember getting called into a room and a third of the company was there. We were about 160 people at the time and uh, I was laid off and it was extremely humbling. It was painful at the time, but it was extremely humbling. And I, I'm also very grateful to that experience when I look back on it because it really taught me like how important it is to keep your head down. Um, to, for me to like just appreciate what I already have and for me to work hard and not expect anything. I, I think for me, like I, I needed to have that coming down to earth moment. You got punched in the face and there was, it was just like, it was surprising, right? It was extremely surprising. Uh, I remember like my dad, he called me like, he's like, where are you? I want to come pick you up. Cause like, he was worried that I was going to like, you know, do something to myself. But no, I wasn't in that state of mind. It was just more like, oh, this is how the world actually works. And, you know, what? truthfully, I, you know, I, I actually told Rich this a few 
years ago, I said, hey, if I had hired that version of myself at my company, like he wouldn't have lasted, you know, six months and you put up with me for th- two and a half years. And um, honestly, like the, Z- the Zilla management team, like did everything to try to s- support me. And I, I, I was pretty ungrateful in that. Um, and so I, I got what I deserved, honestly. And I have uh, no regrets about the whole experience because it was such a critical part for resetting my core values and, and what I look for in, in my friends and my company, and my team. Um, and I, I, you know, everything's a teacher. And so at that point, were you ready to go and start a startup? No, not yet. I, I knew I wanted to start a company, but I wanted to get a couple more at bats, uh, other startups to just, you know, build out my, my taste buds, I guess, and, and better understand the landscape. And so I worked at, um, a small, I was the first employee at a venture backed company in Seattle called Optify. Um, and, and was there for a year and a half. And then I joined another friend's company, six person company as, as their CTO. And then that was aqua hired by IAC. And at that point you were like, okay, I'm going to start something. Well, not really. Um, even the starting story of SIFT was kind of a curveball. I think, you know, this is something I, I, I seem to observe over and over is that the universe often, uh, you know, will, will take your best play, best laid plans and, and just twist them in all sorts of funny ways. But in 2011, I was in Seattle. I was, you know, at this startup that had been aqua hired, happily vesting in peace, um, working for IAC. And, uh, my friend Brandon, a um, college buddy, he had gone down to San Francisco to work at Google, and he was applying to Y Combinator with uh, another coworker of his from Google. The night before the interview, the YC interview with Paul Graham and whatnot, he um, gets an email from this coworker, this original co-founder, and the guy's like, I can't do this. I'm not ready to start a company. I'm not ready to leave Google. And so Brandon loses his original co-founder like the night before the interview, but to his credit, he's such a per, you know, persistent and, and gritty person. And I respect the hell out of him. And he um, goes to the interview anyway and gets in. And Paul Graham and, and the partners are impressed by Brandon. And they think that you know he's got what it takes to figure things out. And so he is in Y Combinator. And a few weeks later, this is like you know uh, March of 2011. A few weeks later, he comes up to Seattle and we're catching up and he tells me the story that he got in. I'm like, Oh my God, that's amazing. I'm so happy for you. But even then I wasn't planning on doing anything. Yeah. Um, you know, I was really happy for Brandon, but I was vesting in peace. I had all my friends and family in Seattle. Like, you know, I've been there for, you know, um, more than 10 years at the point at that point. So Brandon goes back to San Francisco and we stay in touch. And then fast forward to June of 2011, the right before Y Combinator started that summer where I met you, um, Justin, the, the I was reading this book, um, Tony Shea, he wrote this book called Delivering Happiness. Yeah. The Zappos uh, co-founder and CEO. It's a really good one. Yeah. And I was reading this book on the way back from Vegas, actually. And it just... that's a lot of like, Vegas trips in this story. A lot of Vegas. Vegas, <laughs> Vegas is where all the magic happens. That's, that's the real gist of this episode. Um, but yeah, that book really changed my perspective on risk management, on taking advantage of opportunities, on what living a good life really meant. And as I got off the plane, I just... Immediately, I emailed Brandon. I was like, "Hey, you know, I, I'd be interested in potentially starting something, something together." And he uh, initially was uh, hesitant because he didn't want me to risk everything I had to come down to San Francisco and, and potentially fail. And you know, I, I said to him, I, "I appreciate like the sentiment. At the same time, I, I think I know what I'm doing. I know what I know what I'm getting into." And you know, we would talk back and forth about the kind of company we wanted to build, and you know what kind of company we wanted to run. And, and so um, fast forward to a few days before the first YC dinner and it's decision time for me to, to start SIFT or not with Brandon. And Brandon is all, all ready to go. And so I said, hey, let me go talk to my parents. And I talked to my parents and, and honestly, it was, uh, it was tough because I think for them, they wanted me to be um, safe and happy. And I appreciate that sentiment. At the same time, I, I knew in my heart that this felt more right to me. And so um, Sunday night, I packed up my apartment into my car and, uh, you know, canceled my lease. And then the next morning, I I remember pulling out my parents' driveway um, in Seattle. I just started crying. Like, I couldn't help myself. I was just like tears flowing down my face. I was like, this is the stupidest thing I'm ever <laughs> going to do. Uh, why am I doing this? 
but then, you know, I stuck with it and drove 12 hours down um, from Seattle to San Francisco and, um, and one day and, and didn't know where I was going to live. I actually called up um, our eventual CTO. He was my old boss at Zillow and he let me stay with him for the first few days and found other places to live. And, and here we are, you know, uh, nine years later. So did you and Brandon have an idea for the company at the time or? We knew we wanted to do something with machine learning. The original idea that Brandon had and got into YC with was going to be a uh, mobile app that showed you fun activities, so fun social activities within, you know, five miles. I think that's like the most common startup idea ever for local social mobile. Yeah, we called it the loco mo. Yeah, so so we we knew we wanted to do something with machine learning, but we didn't know exactly what to apply it to. So ironically, we were like a solution in search of a problem in some ways. Nine years later, it's still the still company still exists and and is as well, and so it's another example of you know things get started so many different ways. There's, there's so many different routes to to success. How did you end up figuring out your current business, like how, or what you wanted to build? Like how did you end up going from pivoting from you know slow low mo yeah. uh, to fraud detection? Yeah, I mean. We had asked a bunch of our friends who had worked at different companies, what are some challenges that their business needs help with? And a big theme that came up was around fraud. And we didn't know anything about the space at the time. We were outsiders. We were just engineers that knew how to write code. But as we studied the space more, it was pretty obvious that a lot of the industry um, solutions at the time were, were pretty stagnant in terms of innovation. It was a lot of like rules-based systems that were very reactive and difficult to maintain and scale. And so we saw an opportunity to bring, you know, what, how, how Google and Amazon and Microsoft solve this problem internally uh, with machine learning at scale in real time. And let's apply that to this domain that is deserving and, and, and democratize that kind of technology for the rest of the Internet. Was it hard to to build or did you just like kind of what was the story of like getting out there and getting some, you know, getting traction with it? Yeah, I mean, our very first customer actually was Airbnb, but we had to fight for that one. I think it was, you know, the Y Combinator network, as you know, is very powerful, but it doesn't mean that it's a slam dunk. Like you have to really hustle for individual customers, especially when you're getting started. And I think the advice that Paul Graham would often um, give us is like, you know, you're basically a high, uh, a scrappy consulting firm when you're starting, right? You're just doing whatever it takes to get those first five customers and doing whatever it takes to make them happy. And that was the approach that we took. And so with the first five customers, we, we were working pretty hard just to, to build something that they wanted, right? That's the mantra of Y Combinator and seemed like, it, you know, the product resonated. And from there, we just kind of grew out and, you know, we were lucky to be in a space that was ready and from a timing perspective for our type of solution. Like we didn't have to really pivot in, in any, in any way. It was, it was, um, kind of worked from the day, from the start. So from day one, you know, there's all these e-commerce companies coming out online and there's fraud and they didn't really have good mechanisms of detection. They, they were all, you know, the rule, it was like a very linear rules based thing that presumably there was like a lot of cat and mouse, like they would implement some rule and then like fraudsters would change up their strategies and it was just like that would happen forever. Right. So you guys were yeah. a new solution in the right place at the, at the right time and, and just grew. Like, how did the, how did the company go from there? Yeah. I mean, I think we started in San Francisco and I think the, the evolution I would say is a couple of dimensions. One is just being purely engineering. Like the first 10 people we hired were all engineers. And now we started hiring, you know, an office manager and then some salespeople and then some marketing people. And you really start building a more diverse team in terms of skill sets I think the second dimension is really going from uh, a stage of everyone knowing everyone else very intimately and knowing exactly what we're working on. And, you know, the communication is almost like a mind meld type of communication, like sub 20 people to now having process and structure. And, uh, you know, an analogy I love thinking about is federal, state, local. And, you know, every startup has to figure out at each stage what is the appropriate hierarchies and structure and processes to map to federal, state, local. When you start, there is no state or local. Everything's just federal. Yeah. But then as you get bigger and bigger, you have your sales team, you have your marketing team, you have your engineering team, your product team, like, and each of those are going to have their own life forces. And how do you kind of holistically integrate all of that into a cohesive company-wide federal level culture? That's an interesting puzzle. You know, many startups end up 
with some sort of conflict inside and, and co-founders leaving, like you and Brandon kind of went through a co-founder split, right? Yeah. You know, you ended up, or you were the, you, were you the original CEO of the company when, yes. when you guys started? And so can you tell me what, what happened? Like what, how did it go? I was pretty immature. Uh, if I was to just be blunt about it, I think some of the things I reflected on is that I really um, avoided conflict a lot more than I do do now in the early years of the company. And that conflict avoidance got in the way of me having important conversations with not just Brandon, but anyone at the team on the team. And so I really um, not regret, but I wish, you know, I had known what I know now, but I, I mean, that's the, that's the journey, right? We're all on this journey of growth. The most important, I think one of the most important uh, tools for growing is feedback from other people. And if those people that love us and care about us aren't willing to share that feedback or willing to share it as directly as they should, I, I think there's a missed opportunity for growth. And so I think ultimately I, as a CEO, am respons I, I am responsible for setting the tone of the company and the culture. And if I am conflict avoidant, it gives others a pass to follow and be, do the same. And so this was a big kind of um, problem at the company in the earliest days. Um, and, and I think, you know, still working on it today. What do you think that is? I, I, I found the same pattern for myself, you know, in the early days, I was very conflict avoidant. I was very much trying to avoid any difficult situation where I would have to tell someone what I thought there would, you know, would be bad news or would be negative feedback. And of course, the problem was then it would, fe those situations would fester until I was, felt like I was forced to fire them or make a change or something like that. Um, but I've noticed like a lot of founders, even though they're, you know, they have this bold vision for the world. They want to change the world. They're getting out there, running through walls. At the same time, like they're very afraid to, you know, be in these like, you know, con conflict situations with interpersonal conflict uh, with other people. Like, why? Why do you think that is? I mean, I can only speak for myself here, but I, I think for me, I, I trace my conflict avoidance to two dynamics. One is just culturally. I think you know, I'm half Chinese, half Thai, and what I observe about a lot of my friends and, and my own family um, in terms of family dynamics and culture is like harmony is, is placed at a higher premium than individuality. Right. And so, um, you know, har like having everything work in unison together and, and be conflict free is, is celebrated. Right. Like that's kind of the, the a deep part of our heritage. And it's not something I am ashamed of or, or, look down upon it's more like that's just you know what, what i grew up knowing and valuing is like harmony second i think you know in my own family just how i grew up and and uh seeing kind of the the ways that you know my parents would interact with other others or, or you know my the, my sisters and myself like there was a lot of conflict to some degree in my family that i think put me in a in a situation where i want to learn from that and try to be different but then as i've grown older i realized like there's wisdom and value in what the, that, that was trying to teach me. And the ability to be honest and just say, speak your truth with the people around you and let them, have, let them know how you're, where you're at. Yeah. And I think I realized like by not speaking my truth, then others are not going to, I don't, the others don't owe me their truth. And I can't, you know, have them give that to me if I'm not willing to give it myself. And so like if, you know, I, I, when I was way younger, all these quotes about spirituality and wisdom would never reach me. But now I, I much better understand some of them. And, and one of them is, you know, be the change you wish to see in the, in the world. I think that was Gandhi. But maybe I got that wrong. It's going to say No, that's right. That's right. I think, I, I think that's right. <laughs> but yeah, be the change you wish to see in the world. And I realized, like, I, if I want something from others, I need to first lead by example myself. And so... It's been it's been a journey. I've always thought of Sift as, as a company that that has kind of uh, been a pretty linear growth. You know, you pick the right idea. You didn't have to pivot. You haven't pivoted. You know, you pick the right, right idea at the right time. And I've seen you got you know grow and grow revenue, raise more money, grow your headcount, and now it's 180 people, right? Um, but was the journey for you while you know in the last nine years of creating the company was that like? Did it feel linear to you, or was it a roller coaster? Were there ups? Were there downs? Where were, what were your you know worst points in it? Yeah, I mean, it is absolutely not linear, and I think there's both linear or nonlinear in terms of the company, in like you know winning customers, losing customers, getting rejected by f investors, 
raising money. Like there's that linearity of the company entity. At the same time, I, I completely underestimated the internal roller coaster. Like myself as a person, not even as a CEO or as a tech founder, but just as a person, like my own path. And so I, I think, unfortunately, I think, especially as a first time founder, our companies, well, I observe at least with my, my company is that it, was both limited and uh, driven by my own internal successes and struggles, right? And so my inability, for example, to give honest feedback more directly, like that was more ha having to do with me than it was with the company. But because I was still very much working on that um, and struggling with it, like it impacted the business. For me, at least the most important work I've ever done by far um, for myself and the business is working on myself first because how I show up um, as a leader is is the input into all the other outputs, right? Closing customers and you know making a hire, like those are outputs. But like if, you, if we take a step back and think about what are the inputs, I think um, we often underestimate like where the real leverage is. So when did you start to realize that? Yeah, I mean, I was very lucky in 2013 for. Um, my board member, Albert Wenger from Union Square Ventures, um, he encouraged me to work with the executive coach. And at the time, I think it was a very funny idea to like have a coach. Um, but w when I think about it now, and you know, like every professional sports athlete has like not just one, they have like 10 coaches. Yeah, you have the nutrition guy and you have the, the like conditioning guy. And, yeah. Yeah. And so like, if we are so willing to invest in our athletes to get the best performance, like at the same, like we are athletes as well. You and I are athletes like as business leaders. And so why not invest in coaching? And so I worked with this wonderful woman, Michelle Gale, and she started opening my eyes to some of my blind spots, right? Not just conflict avoidance, but also little things like I, I used to have a more, um, more of a tendency to try to diffuse conflict with humor. So if I sensed that things were kind of going awry, I would uh, make a joke. And often that joke wasn't really what was needed at the time. Sometimes it's best to just allow that awkwardness or that conflict to, to rise and to sit with it, right? And so Michelle, I, I just owe a lot of gratitude to, to how she helped me like see more of myself and connect the dots honestly back to some of the things I experienced as a child and how those behaviors were still impacting me today. And so what were some of the biggest changes that you made? Yeah, I think a couple things. One is just learning how to take a breath and not take things so seriously. Um, I think for me, like I, I've, I've struggled with attaching so much of my identity and self-worth to the company. Uh, I feel like a lot of founders actually go through this and uh, learning how to remember that Jason as a person is a different being, an entity from SIFT, the company. And just because something you know, positive or negative happens at SIFT, it doesn't mean like I'm successful or I'm a failure. Like those two are completely disconnected, but it's easier said than done. Right. Cause like, I don't know, for me, like founding a company is kind of like, it's my baby, right? Like I, I love it and care for it so much. My heart is running around outside of my shirt. Um, and so how do I reconcile that? Um, and, and, you know, care without taking it so personally, like that's, that's an interesting question. I think second, just really um, learning to better trust the world. I was much more of a control freak and I wanted things to be done a certain way. And, you know, to, to some degree, that can be a great strength for a founder. And I, I saw it, you know, as, as a strength for me in some situations. But I think every strength, when overplayed, becomes a weakness. And, you know, I think I got feedback early on that I was micromanaging a lot. And I wasn't delegating and trusting as effectively as I could have been. And so learning to set clear expectations, but not be prescriptive on the path there um, has been an interesting part of my journey as well. And I think, um, you know, these days I, I find myself breathing a little easier because I'm willing to uh, empower my teams more. And I'm very grateful that they're willing to let me empower them. You know, your your personal growth journey has been a real big inspiration to me. I think that some Thank of the you. best things that I've done myself have been inspired by you. I've been constantly inspired, actually, by one of the things I, I really am inspired by is that you're a very open-minded person. You. You're, willing, you're kind of always pursuing new things and new ideas and new, but new things you could do with, you know, with yourself 
Um, one of the things that you introduced me to was this program called Leaders in Tech. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about a little bit about. Can you tell everybody what that is? Yeah, so Leaders in Tech is um, run by Carol Robin and Sue Kim. And Carol Robin famously taught this Stanford GSB class called Touchy Feely, also known as Interpersonal Dynamics, for 30 years at Stanford GSB. And their mission is to really shift the culture in Silicon Valley and try to uh, help business leaders be more open hearted. Um, and more vulnerable uh, and, and really take the core concepts of touchy feely and make it more accessible to uh, people outside of the GSB. I mean, there was a kind of one big core component of the program, right? Which is this T group weekend when you were describing it to me and I eventually did the program after you. Um, and then I was like researching online. I couldn't really figure out what a T group was. Right? <laughs> no one knows, but so what, tell what, what's a T group? Yeah. So a T group, it, 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 in essence, it's sitting with 12 strangers or you and you and eleven others, so twelve people total, uh, in a circle for like four days, where you're just sitting in a circle for four days. <laughs> I know that's that sounds crazy, but that's the essence of it. Is like it's learning how to uh, embrace the here and now. That's a phrase that Carol taught me, and I, I like a lot. It's like instead of talking about something in our past, instead of talking about something in the future, we're really trying to learn how to connect with what's happening right in front of us. And we, we start getting into some very uncomfortable um, areas of discussion around how we experience each other, right? Oh, I noticed that you're raising your voice when this topic comes up. Like when, when do we ever really hear that kind of high quality, hard, but high quality in the moment feedback? Like that's a really difficult muscle, but so valuable, I think, for everyone to learn. And so T Group is like an intensive boot camp for building that muscle. Yeah, it was almost like you spent 40 hours with facilitators and then these 12 strangers giving each other feedback on how the thing interactions, interpersonal interactions that you, you know, in your conversations with these other people land on them, yeah. right? And how, what they think of you and in very raw, unfiltered feedback. And it was in a way like a mirror where I learned all of this stuff about myself, even that maybe behaviors and, and uh, attitudes and ways that I was interacting with other people that were, that were entirely subconscious. Before. Yeah, and for, for me, like one of the most humbling lessons from that whole experience was how in, in my head I am. I, I thought and I'd you know, been given positive feedback from others like, oh, you know, Jason, you're so welcoming and so warm and so jovial. And at the same time, in this tea group, it was it was a very you know um, humbling moment for many people who seemed very smart, who I could trust, to all consistently say, "Hey, Jason, like we don't experience you as vulnerable, we don't experience you as as open hearted, or as as open hearted as you, maybe you think you are." And that was um, painful to hear in the moment, like like all feedback. But I, I really appreciate the message because. Uh, that was, you know, going through T Group for myself was um, April of 2018, so two years ago now, two and a half years ago, and I have really worked on that aspect of my being and, and learning how to say, I feel X, Y, Z, right? Like that is not uh, something that came naturally to me. Uh, I think maybe for a lot of people, it doesn't really come naturally because we don't teach this in schools and in the media, but it's really hard to do. Uh, it was so important because we all have feelings like that is the human condition. Right. And for any of us to, to, to deny that and try to pretend otherwise, like that's incongruous with what it means to be human. And so for me, like learning how to just say, I feel angry. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm laughing about that, but like, you know, especially I think amongst men too, like not to generalize too much here, but I, I keep thinking about, you know, what we're seeing in, in the streets uh, with black lives matter and the police brutality and, I worry that, you know, we could fix all the racism in the world, and I hope that does happen. And I think that we would still have a lot of toxic masculinity. And because we don't often encourage our boys and our brothers and our fathers to talk from the heart the way I just described, I feel sad. I feel ashamed. I feel I, I worry that that lack of openness in our hearts as as men leads to um, a lot of pent up emotion, things that are unsaid that just fester and brew over years and years. And, 
you know, even crying, right? Like crying, every crying is the most human thing. And whether you're a man or woman or whatever it is, doesn't matter. Like you're a human, you're going to cry. And so, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that through programs like Leaders in Tech and, and you and I, you know, just trying to practice this ourselves, like we can raise um, a, a better generation ahead of us to, to be more open hearted. For sure. One, one of the big revelations for me uh, going through the T group was just to understand that emotions aren't good or bad. They're just data. They're just a signal. They're natural. Your brain has various parts of the brain that you know generate emotions. You have an amygdala that you know becomes angry or, or or becomes fearful in certain circumstances, and that's there to protect you. And emotions don't. They're not good or bad, and they don't cancel each yeah. other out. Right? Just the opposite of sadness is not happiness. Yeah. Um, you can be in these states with you know complex emotional states where you feel multiple emotions at this at the same time. And being able to, for the first time in my life, sit with my emotions and be okay. Oh, I feel sad and to express it and then just be okay with that and not need to necessarily do something like go get drunk or, or whatever to, to mitigate or numb that emotional state, um, but rather to be able to sit with it and communicate it. That was like a huge, you know, it seems so basic now, but that was a big breakthrough for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think of um, Inside Out. And the yeah. scenes where she, you know, she's able to combine these colorful emotions into one more complex thing. It's not. It's both you know sad and you know happy. Like it can be multiple things. I think we we are raised with so many labels around things and uh, sitting with something as is, whether it's an emotion or an experience, and not trying to allow um, jump quickly to labeling it as positive or negative. Uh, I think that's been a part of my own journey as well. It's, it's like the judgment aspect. Uh, our brains are so quick to just write everything off as one or thing or the, or the other. But the world is truly more complex than that, as I'm learning. And, and I think our ability to appreciate the, the whole experience as is um, and, and not needing to put words around it, I think, is, is part of our um, ultimate journey. For sure. Um, I also wanted to talk about your, your experience with psychedelics and the healing power of, of plant medicines. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you were introduced and you know, what the impact's been for you? <laughs> how I was introduced was through you, Justin. <laughs> 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 but at the same time, you know, just deeply grateful. And I've said this to you so many times pr privately, but like, I, I you know, I think uh, growing up in Singapore, that's a country where if you get caught with 0.1 kilograms or less of any illegal drug, including marijuana, you automatically get sentenced to death, death penalty, no questions asked, which is insane. But that is the, the yeah. culture and that's the law. And so I grew up with this image of drugs and, you know, as a very blanket term of, you know, everything is really terrible for me and I shouldn't ever touch drugs. And I think this goes back to what I said earlier, like applying blanket labels to things doesn't really serve me. And so as um, I've been lucky to have experienced in the last you know, five years um, with you and others, I think really just seeing firsthand how some drugs and, and psychedelics especially have been so powerful for healing uh, my trauma and from the past and shifting my mind. And you talk about my open-mindedness. I, I really owe a lot of that um, to the power of psychedelics and it just really um, changes a lot of the beliefs that I previously held or at least opens up new possibilities for new beliefs. For somebody who hasn't had a psychedelic experience, what is the process by which, you know, you have this peak experience, you go, you know, maybe, maybe with a therapist in, a, in more of a medical setting or maybe it's re recreational, like what's the process by which it really does open and change your mindset? Yeah, I, I don't know the scientifics of it, but I think for me, it, it's uncomfortable, I'll yeah. say. I think it is scary to for me to, to have uh, held on to these beliefs for all my life and then to have something like a psychedelic shake some of those foundations. And at the same time, in that discomfort has been some of my most profound growth. I don't think there's any way around it. I think this is what it means to grow as a person. 
for anyone to grow, we have to be willing to face the discomfort that comes with it. Otherwise, just stay comfortable and stay, you know, in the bubble that we you believe of what you believe and this bubble of your friends and you know, you're not changing, right? And I think for me at least I'm excited for for change and growth. I think that's that's a big part of my spiritual um, purpose is to to learn, to continue learning and to be a lifelong student. Um, and at the same time I think you know, this is everyone has their own journey. That's something I, I really do appreciate that like it's different strokes for different folks and maybe it's psychedelics for one person, maybe it's therapy for another, maybe it's going on a hike. Like there's many ways for us to continue to reflect and meditate and uh, reconnect with our true selves. Awesome. So I want to ask you about ayahuasca specifically. My own ayahuasca experience, which I don't think I've really talked very publicly about. Um, Me neither. Was, so this will be the first. This will be a, yeah. Okay. This will be a good, this will be a good one. Um, yeah, my own experience was a couple of years ago, and I was going through a period of tremendous stress, and I almost did ayahuasca accidentally. You know, and it's, some, it's something <laughs> which is not <laughs> not something we would recommend to not the say, yeah, not something I necessarily recommend uh, to anyone. But my experience was, um, you know, I had heard about it for years and uh, had been interested in trying it. And for people who don't know, ayahuasca is this uh, plant medicine made from the ayahuasca vine uh, in that's uh, originated in Central and South America as a traditional medicine there. And um, it contains DMT as the active component, uh, which you know is a psychedelic. And so you have this. The first time I ever heard about ayahuasca, I remember I was sitting at an investor dinner, actually, with one of our investors at Twitch. We were It was the co-founders of, of Twitch and, and one of our lead investors. And he had brought a date to the dinner. And his date was talking about how she had just done this ayahuasca experience and she spent the last day or like the, you know, the whole night, you know, throwing up in a bucket. And, but she kept saying, you know, it wasn't the bad kind of throwing up. It was the good kind. Mm. And the rest of us were just like sitting around the table, looking at each other with our significant others being like, what is this woman talking about? (laughs) It was, it was kind of the anti sales pitch in a lot of ways. Um, but that was the first time I heard about it. And then I was, you know, over, over the years, I was kind of got more interested. I tried some other psychedelics and, you know, got a lot of benefit in my own personal life and, you know, from that mind opening kind of expansion. And so uh, I was really interested in, in trying it. And then a friend of mine introduced me to, you know, the, he was saying he, he had, I didn't know how to try it. Right. So he was saying he had, was organized a weekend with a shaman from Peru. That was a, a friend of his. And, um, you know, I could have, I could come and, and try it. And so, uh, you know, I didn't think about it. I asked him, what, what's it like? And he said, it's, it's like a thousand hours of therapy in one night. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, that doesn't sound that great. But, you know, I was like, okay, I'll try anything once. I've, you know, so I, I signed up. And um, what's funny is my wife actually <clears throat> also, uh, my wife Christine also um, kind of came along. Uh, she came along almost accidentally in a way, uh, we hadn't spent a few, you know, uh, we'd been apart for a couple weekends. And so this was our first weekend we were going to be together and I was going to go to this thing. And so I said, Hey, why don't you just come? And so we ended up going, um, to, you know, in central California on the coast, this beautiful spot and drank ayahuasca in this, uh, traditional ceremony. And it was, it was a crazy ride. You know, the, the entire night was almost, I describe it as people cutting together three different movies, um, but all the scenes are jumbled out of order. And so I was watching like one movie was the Justin therapy show, which was, you know, kind of like these episodes of my life and people appearing in in front of me and interacting in them in my mind. You know, my dad was appearing in front of me and I was like screaming at him like, why aren't you proud of me yet? You know, I've done so Mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. And then I work out my issues with my dad. And then all of a sudden, you know, my mom would appear and then my brothers and, you know, it was just back to back. And then the second movie was almost like this, um, you know, kind of crazy psychedelic visions and being transported to different worlds. Like it felt like it was in this Tron like world for a while. And then the third movie was almost like that movie, a perfect storm where like Ben Affleck is like caught out in the middle of the <laughs> Atlantic ocean, you know, in a fishing boat. And there's this horrible hurricane it felt like that. Like I'm throwing up in this bucket and like feeling soup moments of this super nausea and then centering, being able to center myself mm. and, after I was done, that experience was, you know, probably 15 hours. And after I was done, I was lying on the floor, covered in sweat, 
my arms through the wrong armholes of my down jacket, you know, wrapped <laughs> up and I couldn't move. And I was like, why do people do this? Yeah. It was, why do people do this? This was, you know, it was intense. The, probably the most intense experience I'd ever had in my life. Yeah. And I was like, why do people do this? And then I went, you know, I, I, I'm back in our tent with, with my, my wife and we were just like, oh my God, we got to get out of here. We should like just <laughs> drive, drive back to San Francisco and go home. And the, the funny thing was, it wasn't that it was super beneficial at that moment, but over the next year, all of these things that had kind of been revealed to me about myself and the ways that I had been interacting with the outside world, kind of bearing out the cycles and you know the patterns of my childhood yeah. became very apparent to me. And it became shifted the, 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 the water line of consciousness. So I could see the, all these behaviors, you know, that previously were unconscious. And I could, I realized that they were, you know, there were things that I was actively perpetuating, for yeah. example, you know, always needing the approval of other people, um, in, in the world and wanting the outside, the approval of outside, um, of outsiders and, and, um, how that had driven me to be successful and, um, had really pushed me a lot of my tendency to like be an entrepreneur and try to like promote whatever company I was working on and raise a lot of money and have a big company. All of those were patterns of like trying to get the approval that I had never felt like I had gotten when I was younger. Yeah. And so for me, ayahuasca was the beginning of that journey of, of self-discovery and, um, you know, how it works, I have no idea, but it was this kind of amazing, uh, catalyst for me. I, I, I'm curious, like, what was your experience like? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I did this back in February of this year, so it's more recent for me. I think it was in some ways a culmination of my own spiritual path. And I, I agree with that metaphor of a thousand years of therapy in a night. And I think with that comes the intensity and the difficulty of the experience. As you described, I also think it's the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. And I, I would say at the same time, the most rewarding. And I think the word that really strikes me about it, it's it's medicine. And I think we, you know, for me, like treating it with the respect that medicine deserves. It's not a psychedelic. It's not a recreational thing. Like it will punch you in the face, gut, and balls if you treat it as <laughs> repeatedly as 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 a fun thing i mean and even when you don't treat it as a fun thing even if, when you treat it in the medicine be, be prepared to be punched but just you're a little more ready for it because you know that's gonna that's gonna happen and i know this sounds twisted for us to like talk about it this way but like i am still living a lot of stories that are not serving me and these stories are uh from my childhood but they're also like generational trauma like this is something that i didn't quite understand, but I now believe is true that like in our DNA passed on th from us through our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents, we have unsolved, unhealed trauma. And that gets encoded into what we give to our children and, and their children. Ayahuasca for me has helped me be more aware of what generational generational trauma I'm holding on to and has given me some opportunities to heal some of that. And I think we each as a generation have a choice. We have a choice to perpetuate what was taught to us, both the positives and also the not so positives. And we can be the cycle breakers, right? Like I think this is what gives me hope is that like you and I and everyone else today alive have a choice on what kind of ancestors we are to future generations. And ayahuasca kind of like made this all very clear to me on a deeply spiritual transcendental level that like everything is connected and everything is a choice, right? Like I, I'm not powerless. Like, yes, there are things that happen that are out of my control, but I always will have power over how I respond to those things. And that's for me like a, a shift because I think oftentimes I would play sometimes like I'm a victim. Like this yeah. is happening to me. And I think instead, you know, I try now to look at things as happening for me, um, even the worst possible things. And like we said earlier, like worst is just a, a label. It's just a you know, judgment. Um, and at the same time, like I think there's a teacher in every lesson, every opportunity. Have the lessons of ayahuasca made you happier? That's an interesting question. I, th I don't know if I, I, I keep going back and forth on this where like, I think more and more my own personal philosophy is that happiness is a journey. 
it's it's not really an end state. Like happiness is the work versus happiness is a thing that we achieve. Yeah. And so ayahuasca has made me happier in that I did the work versus like, oh, all of a sudden after ayahuasca, I'm you know feeling happy. It's more like, oh, those very powerful, dark experiences that I had give me contrast, right? And give me a lot of gratitude, which then make me, you know, is, is something that helps feed into my happiness. But it's like all these other things that are inputs into the happiness journey that I think ayahuasca has helped me unlock. Um, and I think just like, you know, what I said earlier about feeling more connected to everything and everyone, I think I used to be a lot more selfish and I'm still working on this today, but I think realizing like, it's no longer about me. Like the world does not revolve around me. And instead, you know, what can I do to serve others? What can I do to help this world? What is going to, what's my, what's my legacy going to be? Is it going to be that I became filthy rich, which is what I used to want? Or is it that I made a lot of other people happy or I helped, you know, I helped their lives be better in some way? Like, I think I'm, I'm starting to wake up to bigger questions like that. Would you be willing to talk about your journey with depression? Sure. So, you know, one of the things that I've struggled with myself, and I wasn't even conscious of it until recently, was that I think I've gone through various parts of my life being fairly depressed and not knowing it. Like, yeah. thinking kind of, this is normal. Yeah. Um, but I remember times at my startup when I, you know, just didn't want to get out of bed. Yeah. Or I was burned out because I'd yeah. worked not even work too hard, but like the emotional thrash of the company had been, you know, almost too much in yeah. for, and I, I was like shutting down yeah. at times. And I didn't really realize that until a couple of years ago that that was kind of a constant part of my life. Not that I was always in that state, but I was constantly be going back to that state. Yeah. I'm curious, like, you, you know, we've talked about your own experiences with, with depression. Um, how did that manifest for you? you know, yeah. You I mean, I would say uh, you're spot on in that, depression for me has been uh, it was so invisible like it was like this fog that i didn't even know was there and it just slowly set in for me i would say starting like 2012 2013 shortly after starting the company like i i i would just feel less inclined to see people and i think the deepest parts of my depression was from 2014 to 2017 where on weekends i would literally not leave my room I would just stay in bed, yeah. and watch movies, and not want to talk to people. I would order takeout and uh, eat really badly, and just uh, feel very uninspired. And like, I think the hardest part for me, honestly, through that moment was that I didn't know one what was happening to me, and two, I didn't know how to talk about what was happening to me with anyone. And this is why, you know, this this touchy feely stuff that we've been uh, lucky to be a part of, I think, is so important. Like learning how to say, I feel depressed. <laughs> like that language would change the world if we could just make that more okay to say. Yeah. I feel I'm struggling. I, I need help. Like those words should be as normal as, you know, uh, you know anything else in, in our language, but it isn't. And I think, you know, we have a job as business leaders to start shifting the culture a bit because I can promise you that everyone is struggling and some of us are just better at hiding it than others. But for me, like, I think um, the psychedelics really honestly was the thing that broke me out of it. Uh, I, I, it just helped me see myself a little differently. I think deep down, like during my deepest parts of my depression, I was struggling with worthiness. Am I worthy of love? Am I worthy of respect? Am I worthy of this to be in this world? Right. And like, does this world even need me? Not that I had suicidal thoughts, but more just like. I didn't understand my own intrinsic self worth. Yeah. And um, that's, that's, that's been a big part of my journey the last few years is learning to remember that no matter what happens with my company, no matter, you know, all these extrinsic things, no matter what happens in the world, I'm okay. Like I'm, I'm worthy. Uh, and, and like my barometer for my own self worth does not depend on anything else. That's been a big, um, you know, journey and I'm still on it. And so, yeah, I think to those who are listening, like, you know, if you are 
going through something similar, my, my hope is that you can feel, have the courage to ask for help. I mean, at least, you know, Justin and I, like we, we know this path and uh, we need to talk more about this because I think this is a true uh, pandemic of its own. Mental health is something that we don't talk about enough and especially in Silicon Valley, but just in the world in general. And uh, for, for me, like I, I, I wish we, we can, you know, educate about this in, in schools and in the media and whatnot because there's nothing to be ashamed of. Amen, brother, for sure. Uh, it's something that I didn't realize was so much more normal and commonplace. But I would just have those moments, kind of like what you were saying, where I would watch an entire season of a TV show in like one weekend, right? And yeah. like that's all I would be doing. I didn't want to talk to anybody. Didn't want to do anything. Just kind of wanted an escape from my experience of whatever I was going on in life, you know. And be, being able to just kind of realize that's like be conscious that I didn't want. That's not what I wanted. Yeah, and it was hard to to do. Um, so, were there any practices or? you know, things that you did that kind of to, to get out of that state or to like maintain, you know, your current po- you know, much more, I yeah. would say positive and integrated attitude. I would say like, so the psychedelics broke the dam open, but it wasn't going to be sustainable. All right. It right. just helped me like wake up like a little bit more like, Oh, it doesn't have to be this way. So I think putting things into practice really makes a difference. And I think you know, being vulnerable, like this is where touchy feely and other things have really helped but just learning how to just s- speak from my experience. Because I think something I noticed about myself is that I would say you. Yeah. Uh, I would say I would say things that don't have the word I in it when it should have the word I in it. Because really what I'm trying to speak from is my own experience. Right. And it's it's tricky. It's really crazy that this is like a thing that <clears throat> I needed to work on and I'm still working on it. The less I use the word I when I should means that other people aren't going to be using the word I when they should. Could you give an example? Yeah. So I might say like, you should, you should X, Y, Z, you should do this thing. And instead it's like, no, if in my experience, I have done X, Y, Z, and this is what I learned from it. That's a very subtle shift, but the former is advice giving, which I've also learned is really terrible in most of the cases. And and it's not that helpful. Um, and it's also very distancing, right? Like I'm not offering something to you about me. All right. And I think from my own experience with lit and others in our YPO group, like when someone is willing to share from their experience, it empowers others and encourage, inspires others to share from their experiences. And through that vulnerability creates connection and support. And that I think is a lasting, uh, lasting practice for helping of um minimize depression is creating deep connection with other people i think for me like part of what got me into the deep depression in the first place was that i felt so alone i felt like i didn't have deep connections with a lot of people i was very good at pretending like i did i was very good at the surface level hey let's you know be facebook friends be on linkedin like you know i'll see you at parties and whatnot and I realized for me, at least that's not what makes a fulfilling life. Like, I think it's important. I think for me, I want to live the rest of my life with um, more focus on deep connection and those who are willing to, to offer it. Right. Cause it takes two to tango too. Right. Right. Like if, if, if one side, if only one side is very vulnerable and the other side isn't like that doesn't create deep connection either. Yeah. Connecting deeply with other people was something that I always wanted to do when I was younger and didn't know how to do. You know, and so I felt that I, you know, for whatever reason, wasn't, you know, I looked at people who were popular or seemed to have a lot of friends or connect with other people well, or who could just sit down and have a conversation with someone who's a stranger and really like go deep with them. And I was impressed and jealous in a way. And so when I was younger, especially when I was starting out my career, I was like, and, you know, probably when I was in high school and college and then early, you know, early 20s. I thought, oh, if I'm just, if I do things to attract people to me, then I'll have that connection, mm. right? And so those things were, let me be a successful founder, or let me make a lot of money, or be do, always the guy who's doing cool things, or whatever yeah. it was, and I would try to attract people to me, and I got a lot of surface level connections, like you're saying, maybe the Facebook friends, or LinkedIn, or whatever, or I was popular online, or whatever, but it didn't feel like a deep connection, and it was only very later, much later in life, that I realized that 
you know, connection with people, you don't need to have anything to do. You don't need to be a mm. celebrity or famous mm. or, or have money or, or be successful to yes. um, have a deep connection with someone. All you need to do is approach that person with curiosity and vulnerability. Yeah, right? and if compassion too. And yeah, if you're com- compassionate to other people, if you're curious about them, you want to learn about them, you realize that you can learn something from everyone and you approach with the willingness to be open and share and be vulnerable yourself, then you will form those connections regardless of, of who you are. And the things, you know, that connection and feeling of closeness with others that I always craved my entire life was available to me the whole time. Yeah. And then the other thing I, I would add to that is just like over my past few years walking this more spiritual path, just I believe deeply more than ever that there is more that connects us than divides us. Every, every You take any two people or any three people, any set of people in the world and you put them together in a room I believe that with enough compassion and curiosity, as you were saying, they will find things that they connect over, right? Like we, we all have different experiences for sure, but the core emotions that we've felt in those experiences is a, is a finite spectrum, a, sp- a finite color wheel of emotions. And so when we create space for others to share their story and hold space for them in that you know, when you share a story and I, I, I sense an emotion that, and that emotion brings up something for me and I share my story and then that emotion, that story brings up an emotion for you and vice versa. Like that's where the deep connection comes from. It's like, oh, even though we didn't have the exact same circumstances, we've actually felt similar things. Yeah. Right? And I think that's a, you know, it's easier said than done, especially in this fast paced world to like just stop and listen, like to really make time for people. And I think that's what we could use a bit more of. I guess I want to wrap on a one final f- f- question, which is, how do you think you merge, you know, these two worlds? Right, You've, mm. I've started off going really deep on startups and business and achieve success there. You know, you have a company uh, that's a large company here in Silicon Valley that people would consider like a pretty, a very successful company, and that was driven a lot of by a lot of external things that you wanted in the world when you were younger, and then now you've in the last couple of years, we've been on this self-growth path and, and a higher consciousness in your own life um, with this mission, uh, you know, personal mission that you've kind of discovered around um, creating good in the world. It, it's, it's something I'm still navigating, honestly. I feel like I have one foot in one door and one foot in another. If I listen to my heart, it's not telling me to abandon one and go to another. It's telling me that, hey you're living this life and you have these experiences so that you can find ways to create a beautiful intersectionality of the two. And I do think that as more talent and businesses become more competitive than ever, employees are going to, when all things are equal, are going to gravitate towards cultures that are more conscious and more compassionate, more intentional, more heart led. I think that, especially in Silicon Valley, what I've noticed is a lot of celebrato- celebration of great business minds, right? Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos and you know um, Elon Musk, and, and they're incredible people. I have, I have all the respect for their work. At the same time, I, I wonder if we're gonna see, I hope we see a shift um, to a more balanced workplace culture that isn't just strictly about solving great problems. It's also doing it with humanity and doing it with consciousness and, and the cultures that we build, you know, touchy feely and and being able to speak vulnerably should be kind of a mandatory training for all employees. And I don't know, I think a lot of times I grew up with this image that work and personal should be separate. And I, as I get older, I realize like that, that that for me it doesn't make sense. Like we are human wherever we go, whether it's the office or at home. And to open up about our experiences, especially in the office, and to talk more openly, like the way that you and I are talking, like this is actually pretty scary for me because I haven't talked openly about ayahuasca. But I know that you know maybe some of my teams or my customers are gonna, or investors are going to listen to this. But like this is this is what it's about, right? Like they also have some incredible stories to share as well. And I would love to hear them. And so someone's got to start, right? I think it starts at the top, right? Like you and I having been fortunate to have some success and to have a network, like we can pave the way for a different world. And so I think, 
you know, for, for me, like just to answer your question directly, like it's not about le- leave, leaving behind the business world and, you know, going and being a monk or something. Right. It's <laughs> like, I think we can, we can bring the best of both. We can marry the two in, in a really beautiful way. That's, that's a beautiful thought. And I hope that vision for conscious companies com- comes into, into fruition. All right. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. It was a pleasure. That was my conversation with Jason. I loved where our convo went and especially around his willingness to get vulnerable. Really liked that. And I also love that I got the chance to talk about ayahuasca, which really has changed my own life. I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. If you like it, just bang out that five star rating on iTunes and please hit me up at Justin Khan on Twitter with feedback. I also wanted to shout out my friends at Artifact again. George and Ross created uh, this pretty unique company that helps you make personal podcasts with people in your life. Uh, These are really good gifts, and they were really responsible for encouraging me to create this podcast and helping me to produce it. So if you like it, you can thank them. So check it out, getartifact.io, and I will see you guys next week. Bye.